Hello, this is Professor uh, Kevin. It's fine. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, some of the theories you'll be encountering in the Lab 2, Energy and Matter for SCC uh, 110. So there are three topics, um, exothermic, endothermic, heating curves, and calorimetry, Q equals MS delta T. And I'll touch a little bit about those three um, in a moment. So energy heat. Heat is the thermal energy that moves from one body to another. Um, usually when we put our hands on something hot, we don't say that, for instance, that stove has a lot of heat. We usually say it's very hot because heat is actually is the movement of one from one place to another. And as you guys know, hopefully, uh, heat travels from hot to cold things. The unit of heat, the SI unit, uh, SI is a Système International d'Utilité. It's a French uh, word, French governing body came together to put SI units. I'm sure as you know from your lectures, for length it's uh, meters, for mass it's kilograms, for temperature it's Kelvin, for amount of substance it's moles. So the SI unit for heat is joules. And there are some conversions here. We have one joule, sorry, 4.184 joules is one calorie. And as you know, one kilojoule is 1,000 joules. And this depends on for amount of heat being transferred. As you probably experienced, if you had a big cup let's say a cup of water, and you wanted to raise the temperature by one degree versus a big, say, bathtub full of water, and you wanted to raise it by one degree Celsius, uh, it would take more energy for the bathtub. Uh, you'd have to enter in more energy into the bathtub for the temperature to rise by one degree. You'll be uh, looking at some foods uh, in your lab. So again, some unit conversions. One cal, this is capital C, is 1,000 calories, which is also equal to one kilocal. So just some review from your uh, unit conversions, conversion factors. If I had how many, question is how many kilocals are there in 10 joules? So you'd write out 10 joules. You'd first convert it to kilojoules. One kilojoule on top. For every one kilojoule is 1,000 joules. Therefore, the units will cancel for the joules, and you're left with kilojoules. And we just know from here, one kilocal, which is the desired answer we want, the question is asking kilocal, one kilocal is 4.184 kilojoules. So if you look at the question, the units will cancel, the joules will cancel, the kilojoules will cancel, and we're left with kilocal, which is the desired unit. So when you multiply everything out, units cancel, you get 0 0 0.0039. And as you have to report in every single lab, you always have to have a number and a unit. So this will be kilo cal. And the answer is also here. I wrote it in scientific notation as well. You also be, as I said, looking at foods. In this case, we have carbohydrates. 
if we wanted if we had wanted to convert it to kilojoules so instance if we had one uh, gram of carbohydrates in our food uh, we would multiply by 17 to give us 17 kilojoules for every gram of um, carbohydrates this is called a calorimeter which maybe you've seen in class which is supposed to be in our lab uh, maintaining the temperature if we did an experiment let's look at the equation first the experiment here the sorry the equation here is q equals m s delta t q stands for the heat m stands for the mass s stands for specific heat and delta t is the change in temperature this is a calorimeter high-end calorimeter much more sophisticated than the one we will use in the lab here let's say I gave you a piece of meat okay so a piece of meat a food and I knew the mass of this piece of meat let's say I knew the specific heat of the piece of meat every particular element or compound or substance has a specific has a specific heat for water it's 4.184 um, so if I gave you the specific heat of a piece of steak let's say I knew the mass of the steak if I were to light up that piece of steak I could measure the temperature change meaning that I light up the piece of steak it will give off heat and I can use this thermometer here to measure the temperature change so if I knew the temperature I knew the specific heat of steak and I knew the mass of the steak I could get the energy okay and this energy can be be reported in kilojoules we know how to convert it to kilocals and this is one way when you pick up a piece of food at the grocery to figure out how many calories are in your package of food that you pick up this is one way to measure so one application of a calorimeter don't have to read this but the substance whether it's heated or cooled depends on the amount of material so the mass we just talked about it in the equation q equals m s delta t we know the temperature change delta t and the identity of the material gaining or losing energy um, that's s the value of s so if we know those things we can figure out q which is the heat um, the energy transfer if we look at this particular graph these are some specific heats we don't have to memorize these values here but one thing you should be familiar with is the specific heat of water which is 4.184 joules per grams per centigrade or celsius and this is an important uh, factor that we have which means that it takes 4.18 joules of energy for one gram of water to increase its temperature by one degree celsius and this is important because if the world was as you sorry the world is made up of about i would say 90 percent water uh, majority of water the oceans etc if this world was completely made of lead which has a specific heat of 0 0.128 that would mean it would take a lot less energy or a lot less heat for the world to heat up if this world was made up of lead because it has a lower specific heat but luckily a lot of our planet is made up of water therefore it can absorb a lot of energy it can absorb a lot of heat for before the temperature of the world changes so that's very significant in one application difference so we're glad that the specific heat of water is 4.184 again it means it can absorb 4.184 joules uh, for one gram of water for it to increase by temperature of one degree celsius again using our equation q equals ms delta t q again is the heat unit of joules mass unit of grams 
specific heat unit of joules per grams per centigrade or Celsius, and the temperature change delta T, T2 minus T1. So in this question, it asks you how much heat is needed to raise the temperature of 200 grams of water by 10 degrees Celsius. So you'd read the question, you would identify that the 200 grams stands for M. Because it's water, the specific heat is 4.184 joules per grams per centigrade, which we know from a table. You're not asked to memorize the specific heat of compounds or substances. And delta T is 10 degrees centigrade or Celsius. So you plug in all these values. You notice here the units will cancel out and you're left with 8.37 times 10 to the 3, 8,370 joules. So let's read the next question. There you can pause the video. Um, I want you guys to try this on your own. Okay, I'll show you the work now that we're back. So if we have the equation, um, again, we use Q equals MS delta T. Here we know the mass. We know the mass. We know the temperature change, delta T. We know Q we're trying to find S. So if we rearrange this equation to isolate for S, we get S equals Q divided by M divided by delta T. Simple manipulation of the equation. When you plug in all these values, we get, I'll plug it in for you, 1638 is our Q, 125 is our mass, the units, joules, grams, temperature change is 27.6 degrees Celsius. When we do the math, we get 0. 474 joules per grams per centigrade. Another topic you'll be doing is you'll be making a heating curve. Hopefully you've, uh, you're familiar with these terms. The melting point is where you add a particular amount of heat and the substance will convert from a solid to a liquid. For a boiling point, you add a particular amount of heat for instance, water, when it reaches 100 degrees Celsius, the water will go from water to gas. Again, at 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 373 Kelvin. So here is a heating curve. We have your temperature, this time is in Fahrenheit. We have the amount of heat added. So if we look at, a, if we start with a block of ice, and we add heat, eventually when it hits 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is zero degrees Celsius, this is called the melting point. There, the water, the ice will convert into water. So now if we keep adding heat, the temperature is gonna rise, eventually it's gonna reach a plateau, and this plateau is where you start to see the water convert to a gas. And if you keep adding heat, you're left with steam or water vapor. So the diagonal lines indicate that the substance is heating up and the horizontal lines is showing where the phase change occurs. We have the reverse. We can have a cooling curve where we have the freezing point where it goes from liquid to solid and condensation from gas to liquid. And this is our cooling curve. We won't touch upon this, this dip here, um, but in general, it goes from gas to liquid to solid. And then we have again condensation here and freezing.
Another term for this lab or another topic is the energy changes in a reaction. Energy, there are three criteria for a reaction to occur. So if we look at the equation A plus B gives you C plus D. Again, uh, these are just uh, generic names for the elements coming together. Uh, we need a collision to occur between A and B for a reaction to happen. We need the orientation of the elements or compounds to be proper so that a reactant can convert to a product. And we also need this collision to have enough energy to overcome something called an activation energy, or we call it a fence or some kind of barrier, Ea, for the reaction to move forward. So we have two types of reactions, which you'll see, exothermic reaction, and we have endothermic reaction. Exothermic reaction means if you have a particular starting point, let's say A and B, and you add some energy to it, you'll get C and D. But if you compare the levels of energy, I think this is energy versus the reaction, you see that the A and B is at a higher level of energy than the C and D. So in this case, what happens is energy is released in an exothermic reaction. I'll repeat that. In an exothermic reaction, energy is released. When you go from uh, water to ice, you release energy. When you go from gas to liquid water, you release energy. Another example, when you light a match, you release energy in the form of light or heat. And we have the reverse here. We have endothermic uh, reaction, which takes up energy. So if you compare where the reactants start, A plus B, where it finishes, C and D, we see we've gained energy. So examples of this are going from ice to water. You need to add heat for the reaction to go forward. For some of you biologists, for photosynthesis, you need to add energy from the sunlight for uh, photosynthesis to occur. So the exothermic reaction here, heat is released, just a summary, and you can write it out like this. These are examples where we have C plus O2, carbon plus O2 gives you CO2, and we release energy, so 393 kilojoules of energy is released. Our delta H, which we'll talk about in your lecture class, is a negative 393 kilojoules. So when you have a negative value, the delta H, which is enthalpy, which you'll talk in the lecture, uh, when it's negative, you have a release of energy. Conversely, this is an endothermic process. If you remember, endothermic means you will gain energy. You have to gain energy for the reaction to occur. This is photosynthesis. We have here the energy on the reactant side. 2519 kilojoules for photosynthesis. And we also have here when H2 gas plus I2 solid reacts with 12.6 kilojoules of energy, um, this reaction occurs to give us hydrogen iodide.